Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Yes, good afternoon. Welcome to the new era for energy politics. My name is Tian Wei. I'm a moderator and host of CGTN China Global Television Network. But I'm not the main characters here. They are here. The reason we are talking about a new era is because we know there are dramatic changes that is going on right now. Meanwhile, we also know in a new era, people get concerned, worried, but people also get excited because there are both challenges and opportunities. So what we have is a group of wise men and women, should I say, coming from different areas of energy. And they're here to help us understand what exactly is going on and what is going to be our new map and our new solutions. So without further ado, let me introduce the five of them. From there, we have Dr. Fatih Biro, who is the executive director of the International Energy Agency. Welcome. Thank you. Over there, we have Mr. Ian Khan, who is the group chief executive of Centrica from the United Kingdom. Welcome as well. On my right hand, Mr. Gao Jifan, coming from China, chairman and chief executive officer of Trina Solar from China. On my left side, immediate, His Excellency Dr. Mohammed Saleh El Sada, who is the Minister of Energy and Industry from Qatar. Welcome. Last, but certainly not least, co-chair of the World Economic Forum for the year 2018, and also a wonderful businesswoman, Ms. Isabel Kosher, who is the Chief Executive Officer of NG coming originally from France. OK, we got five of them. I don't need to talk a lot. So let's start with a very general question, but really insightful question as well. What exactly is going on? What do you think is the most profound changes that is happening right now? Shall I go to you, Mr. Barol? As you wish, so shall I start? Yeah. OK. Brief. Concise and precise. That's a great example for the other panelists. Both concise and precise <laughs> at the same time. Okay. There we go. Very good. So, okay, when we uh, look at the energy markets, we see, of course, uh, I'm sure we all agree, there are a lot of changes. But uh, I believe four of them are extremely important, and they have the transformational character, which we may call upheavals of our uh, energy industry. And they are coming big, and they are coming very quick. Mm. What are those four upheavals? Number one, United States set to become <clears throat> the undisputed leader of oil and gas for many years. As a result of shale revolution, it has huge implications for the prices, oil and gas prices, energy security, for exporting countries, for importing countries, this is number one. Mm. US, shale oil, shale gas coming in big, big uh, time. Number two, renewable energies, especially solar power, it is becoming the cheapest source of electricity generation in many countries. And is competing with traditional fuels for the next power plants to build. And it is not only in the so-called industrialized countries, but also in emerging countries such as China and India. Right. It's number two. Number three, China, the largest uh, energy consumer of the world. China it is, is changing its energy policies, economic policies, mm -hmm. which has been summarized by President Xi in the latest Communist Party Congress under the motto of making the skies of China blue again. So China is pushing in the direction of this time clean energy and natural gas, unlike what we have seen. The sky is seen. not the blue, the mood. Mm. So this is number three, China changing policies. And fourth, electricity consumption is growing much faster than the energy consumption. So therefore, our energy world is being electrified as a result of new drivers such as cooling needs, 
such as electric vehicles, right. such as uh, digitalization. So these are the four upheavals I see, which is transformational in nature. And no country, but no country is immune to these changes and their implications. No country is immune. So you specifically mentioned several countries, China, the United States, and those in the Middle East. About that point, I want to come to you, uh, Minister al Sada. What about those changes to you mm -hmm. and your country? Um, as you know, uh, the world uh, needs more power and, uh, and more energy. Now, uh, I think Dr. Perol can bear me out here by, with all the efficiencies introduced through technologies, the world will still need something like 30% more energy by 2040. Now, that 30% plus the base which is required today, there will be shift in that uh, percentage, if you like, in that distribution of different, uh, the, the pie itself of uh, the energy mix. How that will happen, in my view, it will happen uh, in a gradual uh, way rather than uh, just a sudden shift. And, um, but reality also, shows us that the pie is gonna be a little different with time, obviously, but all sorts of energy is required. Let me give you an example. Ever since humanity started uh, uh, their, uh, uh, if you like, uh, 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 consumption of energy, uh, they started with the most primitive biomass. Biomass is still there. So humanity added different types of, of uh, uh, energy, but never subtracted. Uh -huh. Never one became obsolete. And I think, I will give example on the hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons will still be needed and fossil fuels will still form more than uh, three quarters of the energy mix by 2040. Well, Mr. Minister, you already started by talking about the start of the human being. Uh -huh. That gradual, that process? The process actually is certainly accelerated, but the percentage, if you like, change will not, in my view, be uh, as dramatic as mm -hmm. uh, many uh, would imagine, but it will take uh, its time. The world now is uh, 7.4 or so billion, uh, the population. By 2040, they may exceed 9 yeah. uh, billion inhabitants on the earth. But one important uh, aspect of the demand is the standard of living. Standard of living uh, in introduced uh, uh, in over the past few decades have increased the uh, consumption of energy right. uh, per capita in an exponential manner. All right. Mr. Minister is arguing we are going to be relevant for a long time to go. That is exactly what you are saying. Let's go to Mr. Khan. Is it? Well, look, first of all, <clears throat> we are in a major transition. Energy, we spend $7 trillion a year on energy. It's 10% of global GDP. And there have been major shifts before, from wood to coal, from coal to oil and gas. Now we're in another one, towards zero carbon and renewables. Mm -hmm. And it's going to, we're trying to do it in 50 years. Very challenging. Second point, there are some really clear trends emerging, in my view. When you say we, meaning? We, the world. We're the, you know, if you look at all of the commentary, we're trying to make major change by 2040, 2050. Uh, if you, the, there are some clear trends that have been driven by the, dr the, the, the goal of, of um, mitigating climate change. The first one is that the energy system is becoming more distributed. The second one is customers, as a result, are becoming more powerful. And thirdly, the whole thing is being accelerated by digitization. Now, what does this mean? I think our topic today is the politics. Customers are becoming more powerful. Suppliers close to the customer are making more money mm -hmm. out of new products and services. The power of producers will gradually have to share influence with the customer and there are signs which we can come back to that this change is accelerating and new technologies are emerging which are going to make the system 
very different, like blockchain, and governments and regulators are struggling <clears throat> to keep up. So what do I conclude? The shift to a lower carbon world and a more distributed energy system is unstoppable, and the politics of energy are very much on the move. Oh, really? Okay. How much is it on the move, Miss Culture? So it is really a new, a new era. I, I fully share that. I believe that we all share that. Yes. In fact, that's no longer a debate, which is interesting in itself. It was not the case only a few years ago. Mm -hmm. My, as a business leader, I like to witness the fact that, in my view, that's not first of all a technological disruption. That's a disruption in mindset which is, in my view, the most powerful as a disruption. And it's a stronger one as, and in my view, uh, climate change played a big role as a kind of wake-up call. But when we look at the uh, model of growth we have today, it's not sustainable. More broadly, it's not only a question of climate. We all are aware here that, on average, we speak we burn one and a half planet per year, and we, unfortunately, we have only one. Huh? So it's not sustainable, it's not inclusive, it's not inspiring. So strong awareness and strong impatience. Mm. And what happened over the last years, I believe, is first of all the fact that people, they want to invent something new as a model of development that would reconcile reconcile economic growth and common goods, to say that this way. They refuse to choose. And second, um, it's, the, it's true also within our own companies. Civil society is in our companies. And it's important that, because it gives us the ability to change effectively. Not easy to change big companies. NG is a company, Centrica is a big company too. Uh, with a presence in 70, 70 countries, 155,000 people, the ability to, we have to change fast is because we have the same civil society in our own companies. Second point, uh, it's clear that we saw over the last decade new technologies coming that effectively allow to reconcile. That's no longer an arbitrage between value creation and common goods. We can do the same, the two at the same time. That's a reality today. We have uh, renewable technologies that are now on par with the fossils in a lot of regions. And that's a reality today. So my view is even that as a, as a company, when we decide to become a purpose-driven company, we get a premium. At NG, I believe that I can say that it is already a reality. We get a premium for our colleagues, our staff, with an increased engagement, an increased efficiency. Mm -hmm. We get a premium from our clients. We decided to exit from 20% of our activities and to focus on exactly energy transition. Right. And we have a growth which is far above the GDP growth and the premium from our investors. So there is a way now, and that's new, there is a way to effectively uh, reconcile. And finally, my conviction is that it is not a choice. Okay. There is no winning company in a losing world. There is certainly a will, and there is certainly already a way, according to you. Let's go to Mr. Gao. You mentioned about new technology, yeah. the solar panel and things. Mr. Gao, in China, become one of the largest coming from that country. What do you make of these ladies and gentlemen's comments? And what is the so-called challenges and the pain points that we can develop from there, Mr. Gao, to you? Mm. Today, it is indeed a new era because of new technologies and new mindset and policies. Three factors together, we 
are witnessing transformation, unprecedented transformation. I think there's uh, four factors. First of all, solar energy will perhaps uh, grow at a speed unimaginable by most people. Uh, when I set up the company, solar energy was uh, 20 times more expensive than today, and only 1% of the scale today, less than 1 gigawatt uh, last year. There were more than 100 gigawatts installation already. The second thing is storage, distributed storage technology. It will grow very fast in the next 20 years. Perhaps uh, people are still discussing and perhaps not imagining it yet, but it will happen. The reason is uh, energy is now being driven by technology. Thirdly, the use of energy will change too. For example, electrical cars will mean the mobile power usage will become a new trend. So distributed uh, solar energy and the storage of energy and usage will become a distributed uh, pattern with smart grid as its support and also the technology in the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence uh, together will mean the generation usage and storage of power we call it uh, the Internet of Energy and uh, we, uh, ha we are moving in that direction as a company too. This transformation is rather like 20 years ago when telecommunication revolution started. And uh, that revolution had a major impact on us. mentioned a lot of different directions, and they are different directions. The question is, which direction should we drag on? What is the weird direction that we should develop to? Can we grasp with all these tasks all at the same time when it comes to your perspective? Let's go to you, Mr. Khan. So I'd like to pick up on something that Mr. Gao said, because th this march of technology driving the change in energy is similar to what it used to be in that technology led many changes, the, the, the arrival of the or the internal combustion engine. But what is different is these technological changes are highly distributed. Everyone can connect to them because the world is completely interconnected. And as a result, they are accelerating very fast. Mm. The danger in trying to change the energy system faster than technology learning curves can improve, such as the one Mr. Gao said, is that it's very expensive. And so there is a tension between politicians trying to drive the energy change so fast that it's extremely expensive. And one of the worst examples of this is Germany with the energy vendor, the energy change. But if we harness the accelerating technological pathways, this change will accelerate more and more. So we've got to get the balance right of trying to push it really hard, mm -hmm. but harnessing the benefits of technological learning. Really, Ms. Kocher? I mean, um, it seems that the worry is not just about whether the system is taking the lead before the technology catches up, but rather the other way around. The technologies are already there. When is the system going to catch up? Hmm. I would say that the first generation of technology is already there. And we, well, we all got a lot of examples over the last minutes. But that's just the beginning. Mm -hmm. The more we push renewables in the systems, the more we will need efficient storage. And we all know here that, economically speaking, it's still too expensive. So typically here, we, have, we still have barriers <coughs> to overcome. So, that's a transitional approach, step by step. The way we have decided to, to master it as a company is very, very simple at the end. 
we decided to exit fully from technologies that can be replaced by efficient ones, clean and efficient ones. And there are a lot already. These technologies, we develop them large scale, really industrially large scale, 15 billion euros investment over three years. At the same time, I believe that's key. We, we in, increase significantly, massively, in fact, the effort in new technologies to prepare the new wave, because there will be others in distributed storage. Mm -hmm. Even in uh, PV technology, the organic PV technology that is still too expensive, two, three, three times too expensive. So we are not yet there. Now, but it is key for the future. So we try to manage that a very orchestrated way, mm -hmm. phase by phase. I believe that's exactly the same for countries, by the way, what uh, uh, we see in a lot of countries in the world is exactly the same kind of thing. A phase by phase approach, extremely determined, okay. very deeply managed from a timing point of view. Who is leading the way? Who is lagging behind? Dr. Barol. So, uh, first of all. Obviously, our panelists have different opinions. I, I, depending on which way you are talking about. You are now sitting on the Everybody fence, right? Everybody has its own way. But let me tell you one thing on technology. There are major technological improvements in our energy system. But to compare energy world, for example, with the telecommunication may not be the right way. Because in energy, the infrastructure, when you build a power plant, it is a lifetime of 30, 40 years. So it is a much slower changes are there. Let me give you one example. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody remembers, there was a former Norwegian prime minister, uh, Brutland. And Brutland, at the request of the UN Secretary General 30 years ago, wrote a report on sustainable development. Sustainable, the concept came 30 years ago with the Brundtland report. The main idea was there to uh, decrease the share of fossil fuels in our energy system and the, give a push to renewable energies and the others. 30 years ago, when this move started, share of fossil fuels in the global energy was 81%, 81. And many things happened. As colleagues said, technology improved, the renewables, we made uh, major uh, achievements. We have seen also efficiency improve substantially, and the prices change, government support Germany, other countries. And now, after 30 years, that 81% fossil fuel share today, 2017, after 30 years, is today the share of fossil fuels in the energy mix is 81% still. No change. So what I am saying is some facts are stubborn, in the absence of government policies and regulations. So we cannot leave everything to the technological improvement by themselves. If we want to see changes, we have to push the changes. Otherwise, changes will not come itself. So 81% 30 years ago, 81% today. So if you want to see the shares of renewables, other technologies improving much faster, then we have to take the measures accordingly. Mr. Gao, is that the real picture? I think one thing to do, obviously, is to look back. Uh, Dr. Birol has done that. But a renewable energy technology perhaps uh, is not increasing the proportion. But there are several things special. First of all, um, climate change requires uh, uh, lower carbon emission and a new uh, technology like uh, at the uh, climate conference in Paris, uh, over 190 countries signed up to it. And also new, new technology in Latin America, in Middle East, uh, in India. Solar energy is uh, close to coal-fired power. In the next three to five years, perhaps the rest of the world will see that parity or even solar panel uh, solar energy being cheaper than coal-fired energy, so that's special today. And also the 
the development of systems. In the past, it was the supply-dominated industry. Now, distribution uh, has led to more participants, so there will be more of a user-led energy industry. So these three things added together means it's a new era, different from the last 30 years. It will definitely drive new changes. To testify about the future. That's the argument. So next 30 years may be different than today, but this will uh, critically depend on what government policies are there. Yeah. The technological improvement uh, is there. It is happening in an incremental way. But if you want to see major technological breakthroughs in the absence of the government uh, policies, this will not happen. We have a government official sitting here, the minister. <coughs> minister, your thought? Well, I will... Uh speak about the connectivity mentioned by uh, my colleagues, Mr. Khan. The world is getting more connected, and that connectivity has a profound effect, even on uh, the uh, energy politics. If we look at energy politics, it's shift from producers to consumers, or geographical shift, US, uh, shale oil and gas, uh, China, etc. I think it's, it's more complex than that. Because they are not the only players. Players now is the major companies where the investment goes, the regulations uh, mentioned by Dr. Perol. Um, there are so many interconnecting or interconnected factors that politics is not going to be as simple as one would expect, geographic or supplier and, and uh, consumers. Uh, all the players will have their share in the politics of the energy future, and uh, those with the right vision uh, will uh, definitely have more than the others, but I think the uh, politics in the future will be very much diluted rather than uh, polarized. Mm. We have already see a trend of decentralized power, in a way, when it comes to government's control of energy or government's approach to energy <coughs> and different players coming onto the scene. Ms. Culture, how do you see that trend? Is it going to bring us more innovation and technology uh, as fast as we can, or at, rather the other way around? It's like when you talk about the issue of artificial intelligence. People now not only talk about the technological part of it, but also the ethic part of it and the social impact of it. So very similar comparison we got over there. That's clear that the fact that the technologies now are distributed, not only decarbonized, but distributed, decentralized, is a strong factor of acceleration. Really because it means that uh, in the past, so the answer was, well, the players were, were directly the states. Now the players are the companies, yes. the, the industry players, and individuals. So the consumers, they become pro, well, prosumers, producing themselves part of the, the energy they consume and taking a much more active role. And it is a huge factor of acceleration. That's good news. Uh, nevertheless, politics is needed. I mean, even if we accelerate, it is visible in the figures. You can see that every day, uh, things coming more and more rapidly, but not enough. Not enough. We are not yet in a two degree scenario. You know that better than me. Mm. Uh, so we are more 3.5, 3.6, something like that. So that's not yet enough. So in my view, well, we have all to focus on our own responsibilities. As uh, business leaders, we need absolutely to, a very determined way, implement large scale what is already <coughs> affordable, clean and affordable. Uh, Bertrand Picard founded a very interesting initiative, I mentioned it, which is the um, clean and efficient solutions. Mm. Thousand clean and efficient solutions. Solutions. That is to say, thousand solutions where you can effectively reconcile. That is our role, business leaders, to fully and large scale implement them. That the role of politics to accompany the move, to set up a carbon price. How could we continue to say we need zero carbon in the mix, and to continue to have 
well, fiscal scheme which is not aligned with that. So it is uh, the, well, uh, combined effort we need in order to be at the rendezvous of the two degree, which, which is still a big challenge for, for everybody. I heard an argument a lot, but we do not see much actions being taken when it comes to countries, it seems, for example, about the carbon trading issue. Let me go to you, Mr. Khan. A lot of words. Well, <clears throat> I think some countries are starting to do things. If you take the UK, where I'm based, in addition to the European trading scheme, the UK has imposed about 23 euros additional of carbon tax. That makes a total of nearly 30, and it's effectively eliminated coal from the system in the UK. The, we, we've talked a lot about governments, we've talked a lot about companies. As Isabel said, the player that is the most powerful now is the customer. And it's industrial customers and it's consumers. And they now have choice. They no longer have to take their energy from the wall in a prescribed way. As Isabel said, they can generate their own. They can increasingly store their own. They can control their own. They can make choices on their relationship with that energy. They can choose on its carbon intensity. And this is accelerating with the increasing digitization of the system, whether in a business or in a, comp or, or as a, in a home. We are one of the largest Internet of Things providers for energy control. We've got nearly a million people out there now using our products. This is changing people's relationship with energy. This is why I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I think we're in a very difficult situation, but it's accelerating, and it's accelerating in the right direction mm. because customers are starting to speak up and to use the, the authority that they've now got. Mm. You talk about customers, I need to talk about the customers of China, for example, but because all of you have been talking about the big country, huge market. So Mr. Gao, here's the thing, even about carbon issue, there's a carbon plan already in China, despite the huge debate before taking place about it, and it's there. The question is, how fast will China move as a big consumer of the world's energy, and certainly China such as the other, just as the other emerging and developing countries could quote unquote take this great leap forward without going through all the process but already going to the next stage. So tell me about what is going on in China, particularly to our participants here. I'm not saying China exceptional, I'm just okay. using it as an example. In fact, Yes, uh, China, India, and other developing countries are making a great progress in these fields, and they showed leadership. Uh, this morning, um, Premier uh, Modi clearly said that in uh, India there is a clear plan for to develop in renewable energy in China last year. Um, solar capacity already more than 130 gigawatt. In 2020, it will be expected to reach 300 gigawatt. Why is that? Why the leadership by China and India? Because we see that the new system will not be supported by high cost. It's quite different from the past. Because we can save cost and uh, aim sustainable development. It's new change. And from the user side, from the user's perspective, the users in China take example a lot of buildings on the roof in China. We calculated if we use all the roofs in China, residential, uh, school, or factories, if we use solar, it can cover the totality of um, electricity use in China. We are carrying out a project, millions of roofs in solar energy. 
The people in China welcome this initiative because these give 12% of return if the money that is in the bank is only 3%. Of return is four times of return. So that's why the distributed energy in China reached already last year 20 gigawatt. And it will reach very soon three, uh, 30 gigawatt. So the market force and government combined is very powerful. Um, we provide a solution. We don't invest, and we uh, provide relative uh, services. I mean, a country that is well known traditionally for energy industry, together with your colleagues in this same part of the world. What about the next stage when it comes to your preparation? Well, in, in my country, while uh, Qatar has abundance of. Uh, gas, we export uh, to the all corners of uh, the world the, our LNG. Uh, but again, uh, uh, we are part of this world and we are very careful about the CO2 and the, the, um, uh, the, the footprint, environmental footprint. And that's why we again diversify the energy and we are uh, going uh, uh, through major projects of solar. Um, uh, that is again, complementary uh, to the base load taken by the gas. And in my view that, I again reiterate that uh, most of the countries will find themselves in a similar situation that it's a mix of the energy balanced by the, the market, balanced by affordability, uh, rather than uh, one form will come and just dominate and uh, made uh, other forms obsolete. Uh, the, for example, the, the, uh, even with the best uh, this spread of uh, uh, renewables, you will still need uh, uh, other forms of uh, sources of yeah. energy like gas uh, to, to complement. You know, most of the renewables are intermittent, day and night, uh, wind is there or not. Gas is needed actually to complement yeah. the other uh, renewable type. Mm. Another thing, of course, I have to ask you, because you are from the region, the greater Middle East is changing dramatically right now. The politics, the relationship between the countries and also the new players coming into the fossil field, such as Russia and some of the others. So what would this, all of this mean for the great geopolitical changes that is already going on in your parts of the world? Briefly to share with us. And then I'm sure there will be smarter questions coming from the audience. Well, we think that having the natural resource is uh while it is a bless, but it is a responsibility because we are a member of this bigger community of the world. And we would like to play a positive uh, role. That in sounds so diplomatic, I have to say, yeah. Mr. And Minister. And this, is, and this is reality. And if you see how we acted, how we acted, we invested actually while the downturn of Oil and gas price were very harsh on us. It's uh, uh, in the 80s, 90s, and lately we continue to invest because we know that this um, uh, strategic commodity is needed okay. by the world, and we take responsibility for that. We continue to, to invest, and if you look at the map of investment, you will see the Middle East, especially the Gulf, continued uh, investing uh, while the, the uh, price of oil and gas were down. All right, Mr. Minister is saying, we originally, until now, always believe in a shared future. It seems that what you're saying. Yes. <laughs> Let's go to Dr. Viral before we open it up to the floor. Huh? No, I would like to make two points, one on China, uh, one on Middle East. On China, uh, I mentioned in the beginning that the China is changing, so will the markets. I want to give two examples on two fields we didn't talk much. Mm -hmm. One is natural gas and coal. China put a cap on coal because of, the, again, the blue skies yes. and the health issues, and started to import LNG. As a result of that, because China is a big uh, country, the LNG prices in Asia Pacific, in very few months of time, went from $6 to $11, almost double. It is a China effect. Mm -hmm. Again, let's to understand the impacts of new China energy policies for everybody, number one. Number two, another technology that we didn't talk, uh, many of us like, some of us uh, don't like, is nuclear power. 
Today, China is building almost half of the nuclear power plants in the world. And as a result of that, Chinese bring the cost of nuclear power down. And I wouldn't be surprised if China soon emerges as a nuclear technology exporter, because it is cheaper than the compared to established nuclear technology exporters. This is on China. On Middle East and other resource holders. Uh, Mr. Minister is completely right. They are serving the world, providing gas, oil, and the others. But, but I see a challenge for those countries uh, uh, coming, uh, which is the following. A, shale gas coming from United States, shale oil coming from United States, and the renewables are coming. Therefore, those countries, not in the short and medium term, but in the longer term, there is a need to diversify the economic base, broaden the economic base, in order to reduce the vulnerabilities sure. of the economy to the uh, changes in the international energy happening. prices. It is already happening, but at a speed satisfactory to you? I think some countries are doing faster than the others. It's a diplomatic answer. What about, I, I figured that out. <laughs> what about Qatar? Well, in Qatar, we think the diversification is a must. The journey started, but it is a journey. It will uh, take time, but we are adamant about uh, diversifying our economy. Our service sectors has great potential, construction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I fully agree uh, with uh, my colleagues that we need to diversify further. But what is good is that we started the journey, and we can see yes. that the percentage. Give you an example: of only five years ago, 60% of the GDP was. Uh, uh, for the hydrocarbons, uh, and 40% for the rest. Today, it is vice versa. Yeah. In fact, it, it, um, last year it was 70% uh, the other sectors, and only 30% the hydrocarbons. So the journey started, and we are continuing. Ms. Kosher, very briefly, you want to comment? Yeah, there is a big absent, I believe, in our conversation, which is energy savings. Mm. Because the best energy is the one you have no longer to consume. And the new fact is that this new technology, these distributed technologies, they open the opportunity, which is really new to, to fully rethink the way we not only produce, but consume energy. And our experience, because in our group it is one our biggest metier, is that when we start screening energy consumption, <coughs> setting new technologies, digital, algorithm, sensors, uh, internal, uh, artificial intelligence, etc. you can save 40, 50% of your consumption. So it is a, really a major point in the global equation. And I say that because to me it means that we have to rethink not only the technologies but the business models. Mm. As a group, we started to invest in megawatt, no longer only the megawatt, but the megawatt. The energy you no longer consume. So we have to think at, at a new layer of investment, infrastructure investment, to rebuild heating systems, cooling systems, uh, lighting systems, everything to set up massively this digitalized distributed technology yeah. because it is really, to me, that the big, the, the best <clears throat> answer is, is this one. And it is a win-win. It is a win-win situation. I would even say win-win-win. Savings, climate, job. Win-win-win. I, I just want to add a You have one more to win? A proof <laughs> point. I, just to, the, this journey that Isabel is talking about, which is absolutely crucial, Customers, society wants to use less energy per unit GDP. And just one fact, in 1980, it took 0 0.56 tons of oil equivalent to generate $1,000 of GDP. In 2016, it was 0 0.17. We have reduced the energy intensity per unit GDP by two thirds over the last 36 years. We're still not on the right track. But we're a lot better than we were in 1980. All right. Some may agree with you, some may not. We are getting a very smart crowd with us today. People who are coming to the World Economic Forum, they are always very smart. So let's go to them. They have much more intelligent questions than mine earlier, and I'm sure they know 
whom to address those questions to. Let's have our audience to raise your hand, and our uh, colleague will bring the microphone to you. Anyone? Be supportive. Anyone over there? OK, over there, this gentleman. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Jeroen van der Veer. I think my question is probably for Fatih Birol, but I leave it to you. My concern is, which is not yet mentioned, that it, if you don't have a shared vision, and this question about politics, that we basically will underinvest our energy system. And that means that you, if you think that through, you get high cyclicality, especially at the gas, so coal may be out, but nobody will invest in a coal mine. But for oil and gas prices, we are now used for some years of relative lower oil prices. Mm. But I think it will become very cyclical, the, the prices, due that uh, everybody is reluctant to invest if there is a lot of uncertainty. But later, this may translate to electricity prices as well. OK, that's both a comment and also a question. Dr. Bureau, you want to comment on that? No, I think uh, Mr. Van der Waal, who is one of the leaders of uh, oil business uh, uh, many years, uh, pinpoint a very important issue. Now, the oil and gas upstream sector in the last four years, we have seen investment declining by 50% almost. It is unprecedented. We have never seen in the history of oil, if there was one year a decline, the next day there was a rebound. And this is a significant issue because uh, the demand is growing in a healthy way, uh, 1.3, 1.4 million barrels per day. And some of the fields we have today, which are producing oil, are in a decline. The, uh, the uh, oil fields are like human beings. When they are young, they produce a lot. And after they come a peak and they decline. So how are we going to meet the demand in oil demand in the next few years if we are not investing today? which may uh, be a big challenge for the oil industry. And this is an important point, a uh, very important point to highlight. Chicken and egg thing, I think, but very important <coughs> one. Any other questions or comments? Feel free. Well, I guess some comments from here. I actually just want to pick up on Jeroen's um, point. This is so crucial that we don't have a stop-start process and you said yourself earlier, governments and regulators are struggling to keep up with all this change. One of the things we can do is build on the learnings from the last 20 years. And even if I may plug it, this, the World Economic Forum system initiative that f on the future of energy that Fatih and I are chairing together is trying with lots of work that Jeroen and others have done to make a coherent sense of all this. So governments don't need to keep learning for themselves. They can start to learn from others. Mm. This is going to be crucial if we avoid um, turning from left to right uh, and start to move towards a, a common path. The pendulum is too much a waste of time, yeah. What about you, Mr. Gao? You earlier want to comment about this. Well, so, so you the government in China has been very determined in the change. In the past, we know China used to rely on coal exclusively, well, uh, predominantly. In 2015, it was still 75 percent, but the government set a target that by 2030, coal fire will be below 50 percent. The new increase will come from solar and other renewable energy. So the reason is mainly, well, my understanding is that the Chinese government has seen one thing. When we are driving changes in energy, renewable energy, as you said, will drive technology improvement. Uh, much of this distributed uh, energy is, in fact, uh, uh, driving the upgrading of the industries in China. So uh, China will probably be a leader in the energy change, but also in other industries driving our energy change forward and together with other countries towards a new future. One is this 
struct economic structural reform that China is doing right now, or trying to do at least. The other is about <laughs> trying to improve the efficiency of energy Different. that is going on right now. But whether that goal is too big a goal, we'll see how the actions are being taken. Uh, Ms. Kosher, I know you have to leave a little bit earlier, and you do have some wonderful comments before you go. You have to leave some wonderful maybe, comments maybe before you go. Maybe a last yeah. comment on this uh, key point of shared vision. I'm sure we need As the co-chair of the World yes, Economic Forum for this we, year, there you go. We, we need a shared vision, but we have to focus on the goal, the final goal. What is final the final goal, goal to you? Final goal is decarbonize and build a better society, giving access to energy. You all know that we, there are 1.3 billion people having no access to energy. You all know that without energy, you have just nothing, no, no education, no development no human development. That's a purpose, that's a shared vision. Now, I'm not sure we can fix the technological solutions. We, just on one example, we, uh, Fatih mentioned the fact that we effectively see today, we see that, well, probably the easiest way to clean energy is to go through power. Because power, we know how to clean it. Wind, uh, solar. But never forget that it's only one third of the energy consumption. So to clean the rest, what is the best solution? Nobody knows. Either we move everything to power, but we will meet difficulties, or we find other alternatives. And so maybe you heard about hydrogen. Hydrogen is probably an option. Nobody knows what is the best today. So I believe that our role together is to have the clear purpose in mind and to try, in parallel, several solutions to implement large-scale what is already efficient, affordable, economically speaking, mm. and for the rest to put a lot of options on the table to push them in parallel and when ready to make the decisions. But not too early, because if you do that too early, you are no longer agile. In a context where everything is moving so fast, we would have bet that the solar technologies well, would experience such a decrease in right. price in terms of cost. It was absolutely impossible to predict. <clears throat> Though my point is just to say we have to mix two things at the same time, vision, but agility. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, what makes the, this uh, topic fascinating, in my view, because we have really to do the two at the same time. Right, vision and agility. There we go. Thank you so much for Thank sharing with us. Thank you very much, for leaving now. Yes, you got some keywords over there. Let's go to others for the keywords as well before we wrap it up. Yeah. Mr. Well, Minister. The, uh, shall we consider energy as a purely commercial commodity or strategic commodity? What is your choice? I think it is a strategic. It has commerciality in it by nature, that's fine, but we should regardless of which sector of energy we're talking about. It's, we should look at energy as a strategic commodity. Human being needs it, and they need all form of energy. Uh, population is increasing. We have responsibility to avail energy uh, in an affordable manner. Boom and bust can cause shocks. Um, which will uh, manifest itself uh, down the road five, ten years from, from, uh, from uh, any shock uh, happening. That's not very healthy to any uh, kind of uh, energy. Uh, example, uh, with the, what is mentioned by Dr. Pirol, 50% uh, drop in two consecutive years, first time it happened. Now. That has a lot of ramification. It may manifest itself down the road. If we look at it responsibly, we should make absolutely sure that such uh, shocks, uh, boom and uh, bust, uh, don't happen violently, impacting the uh, energy industry uh, in a negative way. Uh, the least uh, discovery uh, happened in the conventional uh, oil was uh, last year. Their uh, discovery um, to um, 
um, replacement ratio is what, 11. That didn't happen in the last 80 years. That can, can have an effect down the road. We need to have healthy industry. All sectors of energy must enjoy healthy situations so that they can uh, sustain itself, avail energy wherever it is needed. Mm. Sustainability and coexistence, that's what you're talking about. Let's go to you, Mr. Gao. Some key words. The energy industry is perhaps not the same as the new industries. But today, I think two things will happen. One is the participation of users. In going forward, end users will become a very important force in the industry. This is different from the past. Secondly, digitization, uh, smart energy, digital technology will uh, be capable of uh, linking up billions dollars worth of equipment to achieve smart management so that energy production of service will be connected. This is something uh, we will see. There are a lot of changes going on. Some are extremely fundamental. Let's leave to the two co-chairs <laughs> to say a few words, maybe some key words for our audience to take away. Mr. Um, Kong. Look, I, I am an optimist. Despite the challenges, I actually think to what Jeroen van der Veer was saying, there are real pathways that are now understood. If I take heat and power, the first thing we've got to do is energy efficiency. The second thing we've got to do is natural gas, which needs to displace coal. The third thing, where it is politically acceptable, is to use nuclear. And the fourth thing is to gradually move to renewables as they become cost efficient and as the grid is decarbonized. Now, on transport, there's a similar pathway that we've learned a lot about over the last 25 years, which is, again, energy efficiency first, hybridization of the internal combustion engine, then progressively moving to electric vehicles as the grid is decarbonized and as the technology develops. And all of this is supported by more and more distributed energy systems, ultimately leading to solar and batteries being at the heart of this future state. I'm an optimist about the end game. The challenge is getting everybody walking down that path, but we're a lot further along it than we were 20 years ago. Okay, Mr. Barol, you're the same? No. A party cloudy optimist? He's, a, he's or... an optimist and I am a pessimist. I should oh. start from there, so this is the... <laughs> It's so, a balance of power, right? Uh, exactly. So I, I'm, I'm just, uh, oh, let's say, cautiously optimistic, to make it more diplomatic again. Yes. Now, <laughs> uh, now, shared vision is a very good catchy word, a key word. But let's remember the overall title of this uh, web, Fractured World. How can we have a shared vision in a fractured world? Mm -hmm. Put in a more uh, global uh, context. The only, I believe, the shared vision like goal we have is the Paris Agreement. And here, I believe every country will have its own way to reach their targets. And we mentioned, the, uh, I think Mr. Gao mentioned what's happening in China. I highlighted the solar. India is also going in the same direction. Mm -hmm. But why those countries are pushing renewable energies are not necessarily primarily driven by climate change. It is driven by the local pollution in the cities. This is the main driver. We have to be, so if you want to have a shared vision, we have to get the concerns of all the countries together and try to put it together. Because some countries have other concerns, such as energy security, such as affordability of energy. Mm -hmm. So I, in my uh, view, uh, to put a shared vision for the world is not very easy. But if you want to go in that direction, we try to have a, a empathy with all the countries and a build a shared vision on the basis of that. Mm. To solve all the root problems, that would bring us the shared future. All right, I guess we have 
coming back to the very theme of the World Economic Forum for this year. It's a great success and discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Biro, Mr. Kang, Mr. Gao, and Minister Alsana. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, gentlemen, and Ms. Kaushar earlier. Thank you.